So in order to help with solving kinematic problems, um, we're going to create just a, a quick little list here of a, a problem-solving strategy, something that'll help you out that you can do with every problem that'll help make sure that you get the right answer. Uh, so the first thing that we want to do, given a problem, is list all the variables. Okay? Any variable that you can find in the equation, or in the problem, whether you think it's going to be useful or not, write it down. Okay? Second, we're going to look for what are the unknowns. Okay? Um, not, not always what we're solving for, but that should be in there. Uh, some of the times it's information that you think you might need but don't have in there, right? Maybe you need an acceleration to get to your answer and it's not there. Write it down as a possible unknown. Okay, so we need to list out all of our unknowns, including what we're solving for. And then we list useful equations. For now, that's pretty easy because that's just our four kinematic equations, right? And if you don't want to list them out, if you just want to have a list of those equations next to you when you're solving problems, that kind of serves the same purpose here. Um, but we want to have all those equations there ready for us to look at. Okay. Then we're going to substitute in our known values and solve. Okay. So we're going to put in our, the values that we have, solve for what we need to have, and then last but not least, definitely uh, probably one of the most important steps here is check for reasonable results. One of the things I love most about physics, and love more than, you know, just a plain old math class, right, in a regular old math class, a lot of the times it, you're just getting an answer, okay? That answer doesn't have a lot of context, it's just, can you solve the equation by following the steps, right? We have to worry about that here, you have to be able to solve the equation correctly, uh, but we have that little bit extra help in that most of the problems that we're going to work uh, should be realistic problems. Right? If we're solving for somebody throwing a ball, we shouldn't get an answer of 1,000 meters per second because that's not reasonable. Okay? So we should just kind of double check and say, is that result reasonable? That might even involve uh, doing some unit conversion. Right? One of the nice things about having uh, an iPad or a computer or phone or whatever right at our disposal is that you can use Google and just do a quick unit conversion into something you're more familiar with, maybe miles per hour, and see if that's a reasonable result. Okay, so don't be afraid to check for reasonable results because that'll tell you very quickly whether you did the problem right or wrong. So before we go on and, and try a practice problem with our problem solving strategy, I want to throw one more thing at you uh, and look at gravity. Okay, one important thing to remember about gravity is that all things fall at the same rate. Okay, now that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to us in a, a normal world here where we have, you know, things like air resistance, right? If you drop a feather and a hammer, uh, the feather is going to take a longer time. But the reason it takes a longer time is just because of the air. If you were to eliminate that air resistance on the feather, right, the, the air brushing up against the feather as it falls, it makes it kind of sway as it falls down. If you were to get rid of that and drop them both at the same time, they would actually hit at the exact same time because they're both under the influence of the exact same force, which is gravity. So it's going to make them accelerate at the same rate. So gravity makes all things accelerate at the same rate. That rate we're going to call g, lowercase g, is equal to 9.8 meters per second squared. Uh, because acceleration is a vector, and we're usually going to call downward negative, we're actually going to substitute in our equations negative g for a, any time uh, we're talking about an object falling near the surface of the Earth. So for example, in our equation x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared, we're simply going to write x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half. Now our new value, negative 9.8 meters per second squared times time squared. <coughs> so we're just substituting that value in for a anytime we're near the surface of the Earth. So if we're working a problem and it says near the surface of the Earth or, or we drop something or anything along those lines, you can immediately substitute that negative 9.8 meters per second squared in for A. So let's practice our problem solving strategy here uh, with this simple problem. If an object is dropped from a height of 5 meters, how long does it take for it to hit the ground? And how fast is it going when it strikes the ground? Okay, so first we're going to list out our known variables. I know that my initial position which I'm actually going to call y naught since we're working in the vertical direction. So y for vertical, x for horizontal. Doesn't matter, you can just swap the two. So y naught equals 5 meters. Uh, I know that my final position, 
is going to be when we hit the ground, so zero meters, so that's another known quantity. I know that we're under the influence of gravity, so my acceleration is equal to negative g, or negative 9.8 meters per second squared. If I drop something, that means I was holding it and then let go. So that means its initial velocity was zero meters per second. So those are all the things that I know. My unknowns from the equations that I have. Uh, well, I don't know uh, time. Right? I don't know how long it takes. That's uh, something that shows up in there a lot. I don't know my final velocity v. Okay, It's tempting to say that our final velocity is zero because it hits the ground. But our equations, remember, only work when we're under constant acceleration. So only while we're falling. So the kind of after it hits the ground doesn't work with our equations because now we have a new force involved that impacted the ground and that changes it so that it's not just you know what we would expect. It, it doesn't go to zero. So when we talk about how fast something is going when it's dropped, we're talking about like the instant before it hits the ground is our final velocity, right? That instant it makes contact. So some possible equations we can use here. I'm going to list out a couple of our kinematic equations. Okay. Um, I could maybe use V equals V naught plus AT since I'm looking for you know, a velocity and I have some information about these two things, that might be useful. But I'm also missing T, so that's not going to get me there right away. Another possibility, uh, since we're using Y as opposed to X here for our variables, we would say Y equals Y naught plus V naught T plus one half AT squared. Um, that might be useful, right? I know where it ends at zero. I know it starts at five. I know it starts from zero. I know A. So all I'm really left for to solve for is T here. So that might be a good way to get to time. Uh, maybe another possibility here, V squared equals V naught squared plus two A X minus X naught. So there's kind of three uh, pretty common equations that we'll use to solve these problems. So these three might be kind of our most important equations here. Um, I have an a, I have an x, x and an x naught, in this case y and y naught. Uh, I know v naught, and I'm looking for v, so that might be useful too. So let's start with this one, because we talked about how that one might be useful for solving for t. So we know we end at 0, so 0 for y. y naught, our initial height is 5 meters. And I like to write um, any numbers I'm plugging in in parentheses, just so that I know that that's a number I plugged in from the problem. I think it helps me that way. Plus, well, v naught, right, is zero. Okay, anything times zero is just zero, so that entire term of our equation is just going to disappear. So we don't need that. So plus one half the acceleration of gravity, nine point eight meters per second squared, and solve for t squared. So first thing I do, subtract my 5 over there, so negative 5 meters equals 1 half negative 9.8 meters per second squared times t squared. So I'm going to multiply by 2 and divide by negative 9.8. So 2 times negative 5 meters over negative 9.8 meters per second squared equals t squared. So to solve for t, I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So t equals 1.01 seconds. And if we think back, okay, is this a reasonable result? Yeah, I think so. If we drop something from 5 meters, taking about a, a second to hit the ground seems, you know, pretty reasonable. It's not really fast. Um, you know, it's fast, but it's not super fast. It's not less than a second. And it's, uh, you know, not super long. So I think that fits the bill pretty well. To solve the second part of the problem, I'm going to get rid of that real quick. Let's see if I can get rid of these two. Okay, so for the second part of the problem, I want to know, so now I know t was 1.01 seconds. So now I want to know my velocity. Well, I think I have two possibilities here, right? I could use this equation, because now I have t, I have a, and I have v naught. I could solve for v. I could also use this equation. I'm going to actually choose this second equation. Just in case, right, it's possible we could have gotten time wrong, and since this doesn't have time in it, I'm not using that answer I got. So in case I got one wrong, maybe I can get the second one right. So v squared, well, I know that's what I'm looking for, equals v naught, 
which is 0, so that whole term is just 0 and can go away. 2 times negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And x minus x naught, right, or y minus y naught in this case, would be negative 5 meters, right, 0 minus 5. Uh, and then just take the square root to get our answer. And v equals 9.89 meters per second, which makes sense, right? If we're falling for just about a second and we're accelerating 9.8 meters per second every second, I should get from zero to about 9.8 in one second. So now I want to take some time just to look at a, a graphical relationship between acceleration, velocity, and position. Um, to do that, I'm going to draw a couple graphs here, and we're going to imagine drawing the graph for a, a car whose acceleration is positive 2 meters per second squared. Okay, starts from rest, accelerates uh, at 2 meters per second squared for some period of time. So our, start with acceleration versus time. Okay, and acceleration versus time should be just a nice straight line at 2 meters per second squared for that entire time, right? Acceleration's constant, it's not going to change. Perfect. Second graph here, velocity versus time. And velocity versus time, if we're constantly changing our speed, we're changing our speed at a constant rate, we get a, a graph that looks like that. Now what's kind of interesting here, right, if we were to go to calculate a slope of a graph, a slope of a graph is, you know, rise over run. Uh, you know, we'd normally write it as delta y over delta x. Well, in this case, our slope, our y variable, is v, so delta v over t. Well, what's equal to delta v over t? Acceleration. Right? So the slope of this graph is actually the acceleration that we experience, so 2 meters per second squared. So we could use a graph to figure out a graph of velocity versus time to figure out the acceleration of an object by looking for its slope. A final graph we want to take a look at here real quick is x and t, right, our distance over time. If we're accelerating at 2 meters per second squared, that means I'm covering more and more distance with every second that passes. Uh, so maybe I end up with something that looks like that. Um, now that's kind of a, a weird picture to look at. I'm going to kind of continue this graph. Let's imagine for a second our axes kind of continuing over there. And if we completed our graph, you know, not that you can have negative time, but just for the visual here, and something like that. Well, that should be familiar to us. That's a parabola, right? A parabola, you know, should look something like this, where we have y equals, you know, some stuff plus some stuff times x plus some stuff times x squared. Well, we have an equation that kind of resembles that, right? We have x equals x naught plus v naught t plus one half a t squared, okay? So it, it actually matches the equation that we saw. If we were to actually graph, uh, you know, an object using some motion detectors or things like that that we might use um, and get this line for constantly accelerating, it actually matches our mathematical model, which is one of the reasons that physics is so powerful because we can use these equations to actually model what's really happening, right, in real life. Uh, that's, that's kind of one of the, the really cool things about physics, I think, is that all of a sudden we can use this math to model something in the real world. Um, and it fits what we should expect. Uh, if it didn't, that'd be a big problem.